We'll ask everybody to find their places, please. Before we go to our next session, we will have the privilege to hear from Dr. Scott. It was a privilege to just to have here to participate in, in, in the conference. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for coming. And before I call up Rabbi Younger, I think most, almost everybody here knows who Rabbi Younger is and his devotion on both sides, on the medical side and the halachic side, how devoted he is. I just wanted to thank him personally for his devotion to a time and to the couples and the amount of time and effort he gives to each couple to help them in their journey. So thank you, Rabbi Younger. And on that note, I'd like to call up Rabbi Younger. Good afternoon. It is a great schus and Kavalit, a privilege and a humbling honor to address the esteemed doctors, my, my fellow A-time staff members, and of course, each and every individual that makes up the A-time family. The title and aim of today's talk is an ancient Torah in modern times. We were represented this morning with a wellspring of information, some of us were introduced to new and exciting technological innovations, while others reiterated what modern medicine has to offer. It is absolutely amazing that the Torah that was given to us 3,324 years ago encompasses the answer for every contemporary shawla. To give you an example, for instance, the Gemara and Chagiga brings up an almost in a by the way, a, a circumstance of a woman conceiving in a hot bath from sperm that was previously there. In Shulchan Aruch, there is a discussion on the Yichus status of a child born in this manner. There is even an interesting medrash that states that the daughter of the prophet of the Yermiyahu and Avi, the, the prophet Jer Jeremiah, had a child this way. And he, he was a great Talmud Chachem and authored a book called Ben Sira. Ben Sira, liter literally the son of a top. I can only imagine Talmidei Chachamim and scholars in previous generations raising eyebrows <coughs> while learning this halacha and ask themselves, why in the world did the Shulchan Aruch include and discuss a case that has almost no probability of occurring? Abkideikach, that one of the great poskim, the Mishnah Lamelech claims, it is absolutely impossible and never happened. To further this point, a recently published four-volume sefer on Shulchan Aruch Eben Ezer that didn't omit the slightest detail to comment on, except this halacha, as he seemingly didn't feel and see the importance to comment about a situation that is so unimaginable. As modern medicine evolved and technolo technology such as IUI, IVF, PGD, ICSI, etc., are readily available, the fundamental basis for the poskim to determine the yichas of a child 
conceived and born through these procedures is based on the above-mentioned puzzling Gemara. It is mind-boggling that a halacha that sounded so far-fetched for generations was in fact a code that was put by Ashkocha Proteus to be the main source of establishing the kashras of many children born today thanks to the wonders of modern medicine. Precisely one week ago, Claudius Yisrael celebrated the Yom Tov Shavuos and unanimously declared, Naaseh and Ishma, we will do and hear Hashem's voice and always walk with His Torah. Hashem lovingly embraced us with His mission, Va'atem, Tiyu, Lim, Amleches, Koyanem, Vagoy Kodosh, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This Torah is eternal, endless, everlasting and infinite. The word halacha, the term used for Jewish law, literally translates to work, to walk. And Er Lechayid walks only within the parameters of the Torah. Every generation, Cloud Yisrael is blessed with poskim that with tremendous wisdom and siyata de Shemaya, find in the Torah the way to tackle contemporary Shilas. In this generation, Gedoy Layaposkim, including my great Rebbe, Rabbi Landau, that is world renowned for his deep understanding and vast knowledge in halacha and medicine, have established the protocol that an halacha observant couple should go by. The Shilas that are in the Gea for a couple confronting the maze and confusion of infertility, or high risk OBGYN are complex, difficult, and extensive. To name just a few, thanks. Surgery on the male reproductive organs that is done not in accordance with halacha can have weighty consequences. The shyla of producing a sample for a semen analysis or IUI or IVF touches upon an issue that the Shulchan Aruch exclaims that it's chamor mikol isurim shabatoyre transgression that is very serious. A question as yicho status is everlasting for many generations. Every person pr present today has one ultimate desire, to be blessed with healthy children. Healthy children, both physically and spiritually. Children, as Giddish Shamamas cry for when they bend Shlich and ask the Rabbi Shalai Lam Zakeni, Legade El Bonem of Nevonem, Chachomem, and Avoinem, Yirei Aleikim Zera Kodesh. Obviously, this blessing can only rest, rest upon children that were born when Halacha was adhered at every step of the way. The take home message from this talk is three rules ask, ask, and ask again. Every little detail should be discussed with a competent rabbi. No two cases are alike. Never assume that if you got a heter or an iser previously, it's the same now. And definitely never rely or compare someone else's case you heard or perhaps you saw on the eight time forum. The halachas may seem alike, but in fact, in the eyes of the rabbi, the slightest detail could make the difference. I tend to relay a joke. A people have misconception about how a rabbinical decision is made. They think that the rabbi has X amount get out of jail pardons, and he dispenses it to the people at Davin and his shul, someone who sends him a nice shalachmanis, or perhaps to someone that cries the most. The Rav truly feels along with the pain and suffering, yet evaluates the halacha, what it rules in every individual case. Even more, a hetra doesn't always mean that the halacha is no more. Some aterim are left as a last resort only and must stay that way. I would also like to reiterate that one should not leave the shayla to be asked at the 11th hour. It's not fair for the dayan, for the doctor, and for the couple to ask a shayla on IVF when the woman is fully stimulated the day before retrieval. It doesn't make sense. And last but not least, 
all handling of any gametes, sperm, eggs, or embryos, must be done with hashgacha under full supervision. At this opportunity, I would like to recount with you that a time is here to walk you through the trials of infertility with many, many services. A time is blessed with a team of skilled and well-informed selfless individuals who take upon themselves to refer and counsel every case with expertise and compassion. The helpline is run by our illustrious Rebetzin Landau and has on board such distinctive persons as Rabbi Koenig, Mrs. Moskowitz, amongst others. A time staff members work long hours guiding the couples, researching, meeting the doctors, and much, much more. Not once have the doctors expressed amazement on the deep and broad understanding to medicine that the A time staff members possess. The time is short to list in detail the many A-time services, the A-time forum, the Shabbos Nele Hospital program, the library, the magazine, the Shabbos Tone, and much, much more. Every service is backed by good-hearted and hard-working individuals. Of course, under Rabbi and Mrs. Rosen. Please, the services are here for you. Please, don't hesita hesitate to use them. Please utilize it while going through this Nisoyan. I was asked to wrap up this talk by a short word of chizuk. This is always not an easy task. I look at the crowd, many of whom I know on a personal level. I look at the faces and I feel the pain and I realize the suffering. What can I say that hasn't been said? I'll share with you a gewaldig story I heard just this past week. It's about the Tartik of Arav. He lived in Borough Park, passed away in 1988. He's a good friend of my Zayda, the Vojdislav Arav. In, this story happened in the war and the Holocaust, 1944. He was in a bunker in Budapest, and Pesach came around. And he had to lead a Seder, and he, and he led a Seder in, in, in the bunker. And he said a gewaldig avort. It's gewaldig not only of, of the word itself, but at the time when it was said. He asked as follows. We say in the Haggadah, we say, Matzah zi sh'ani oichlem al shema. Pesach zi sh'ani oichlem al shema. Moror zi sh'ani oichlem al shema. It's not in the chronological Seder. First, we should have asked, not Matzazi. So we answered this. While a person is going through his Moror, while it's still the time of Moror, of bitterness, we don't ask any Shilas. The question of Moror Zushanu Eichlem can only be asked when we sit at the Seder with Matzah and Pesach. This was said by a person that lost his, his wife and six children and his rabbanis and all his, all his community and was sitting in Budapest in a bunker, not knowing what will happen the next minute. We do not ask until we're over. My good friend, Rabchil Sapiro told me a beautiful story that happened is, is Rashi Shiva, Rab Chaim Stein, the late Rashi Shiva, from Tells was very sick, and it sounded like it's, he's, he's going to pass away, and his, his whole family came to his bedside in the hospital, and they were standing there with the minion, and happened to be he passed away a few months later, and after a few hours, the situation got, got, got more settled. And it was Tish, the night of Tisha B'Av, and they had to sit down and, say, and read Megillah Eicha. And the re reading there, Megillah Seicha, you can imagine reading Megillah Seicha on the floor in a hospital. And they were saying Megillah Seicha, one pasuk after, after another. And they 
stumbled upon the Pasek, Chaz de Yashem, Kiloi Samnu, Kiloi Cholura Chamov. And one of the Enoch told him, he asked himself, What does such a Gishmak a Pasek, Chaz de Yashem, Kiloi Samnu, Kiloi Cholura Chamov, do in such a depressing Megillas, Megillas Eicha? Where does it come in over here? So he said, we know in Gemara, Eim b'chlal le'lamashe b'prat. If the prat is chaz da Yashem kiloi somnu, then the whole Megillas Eicha is one shtick chaz da Yashem kiloi somnu. Sometimes we don't know why, we don't know what, but it still is chaz da Yashem kiloi somnu. In this week to week's Torah portion, Baal Oisra, I don't know, in your shul, we have to ask Rabbi Yom Fayet, he's the Balkoira. But in my shul, when they, when they read, when Am Yisrael was traveling, you read it in, 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 in a chant. The same thing in Parshas Masay. Everyone understands why the Shira is, so, is, 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 is read in a song. It's a Shira, it's a poem, it's a song. How come the traveling of Am Yisrael, what's so significant about it? What's the song? Is, 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 it, a, is it a celebrating event? What's the song? Am Yisrael was in the desert. A traveling way that should have taken them days or perhaps weeks. Stretched out for 40 years. Mem Beis Masois, 42 stations. Am Yisrael stopped. They had Shisha Bekera Sechat. Every fertility is to be fired for making Shisha Bekera Sechat. But they had Shisha Bekera Sechat, Kinder and Rinder, and they have to take the tent apart and pull it back, um, build it back, and they had no way of knowing when are they going to arrive at their destination. Wandering in the desert in the blazing hot sun, Am Yusuf was wandering. But they were wandering with song. We also matter b'nai shim and shilamil ben tzidishadoi. Why? Because I'll pi Hashem yachni and I'll pi Hashem yiso. Even a, person, a, a journey that should take a person a year or two years can sometimes stretch out to many years. It's the journeys will still be made and traveled with song. Why? I'll pi Hashem yachnu I'll pi Hashem yiso. Everyone is going to reach the destination. After 10, 11 days or 40 years, no one knows. But if it's Al Pi Hashem Yachnu, Al Pi Hashem Yisau, we walk it with the song. Every time you wake up in the morning to see the doctor, every time you have to take a shot, a small shot, gone a left shot, a progestion shot, a Lovenach shot, at every negative test, at every loss, at every bad remark you hear, it's one masa after another masa, one station after another station. But it's al pi Hashem yachnu, al pi Hashem yeso, and therefore it should be sang with song. Sometimes you go to Makelas. You come to a gathering and you walk out besochas depressed. Some remark someone said, it should still, still be chanted with song. Al pi Hashem yachnu, al pi Hashem Each and every one of us will come to the destination. Each and every one of us will enter its Israel. It takes time, but we travel with the song. I'd like to finish with a bracha for each and every one. We should be karav bizoicha. Everyone should get to their destination. 
and Am Yisrael to get to their destination, to Eretz Yisrael. So after finishing, I would like to just welcome three significant people. I can't, I, no one asked me to do it, but I must do it. My good friend, I'm always amazed at, always amazed at what he does. Rabbi Yanki Stern and Rabbi Yitzchak Elia Englander. We also he have here with us, in Hebrew we say Hafta'a Ne'ima. It's translated as a, as a pleasurable surprise. Rabbi Baruch Finkelstein. Most of us here have read his book, The Third Key. Bekarov, everybody should read his other book, B'Sha'a Tova. But please do not get to his book on, on postpartum depression. Thanks. Wie viel ist gut? Okay. Wie pinklich. Thank you, Rabbi Junger, for your warm remarks. And again, the room is available at all times, day and night. He gives his cell phone out to everybody and the other people that work in the time are also available. Please reach out to all the help that you need and we'll try to satisfy everybody's needs. On that remark, so I'd like to call about Dr. Richard Scott. Again, it's a privilege, a privilege for him to come speak for us. It's not, he's not always available. He does a lot of work and he, a workaholic he's called in his place. And uh, we appreciate him to give away his time for coming. Thank you, Dr. Scott. I'm going to move the thing once. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come. Um, I feel, uh, I think this is the first time I've had a chance to speak at such a, a major A-time conference. Um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I feel like my relationship with A-time has gone on for a long time. The, uh, the witnesses and the, the people who have provided supervision in our laboratory, um, without mentioning names, but there's one young lady in particular I think could be in our group photo every year. She spends a lot of time in our lab and uh, is really a respected member of, of our team who helps us take good care of our patients, and that's the way we see her. I'm gonna to try to talk to you a little bit. My charge today was to talk about how pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is changing things. And we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the basic PGD uh, that's been around since the late 80s, and it's very important. Uh, but it has only changed a little bit. And then we're gonna talk about, near the end, how aneuploidy screening, counting chromosomes, has changed the, the nature of what we do and the nature of the outcome, outcomes to the extent that I believe that within the next which one? This one. Maybe I'll hold this one just, if they're close, is that bad? Um, I believe that, is that better now? Thank you. I believe that the, the paradigm for clinical care will probably shift in the next year. Now well, the proof's in the pudding. We'll have to have more data and more outcomes, but they are now up into the many, many thousands. Um, and I think that uh, this is worth thinking about together as a group because it will impact uh, your community as it certainly is impacting our community. One thing you need for PGD, one thing you need for any kind of genetic diagnosis is genetic material. And today, the only place you can get genetic material, which is representative of the embryo, is from the embryo itself. And so we have to biopsy the embryo. And there are three fundamental times you can do that. Up at the very top, um, you can see, I'll use this, a, a polar body. Now this just gets genetic material from the egg, but has been championed oops, by a number of groups for a very long time. In the middle, you can see a day three embryo or a cleavage stage embryo, and you can see a cell coming out of that. That tends to be one cell out of eight in an ideal circumstance, but commonly one cell in seven, six, or even five. So you're removing a substantial portion of the embryo, and we'll talk more about that in a second. And down at the bottom is, a, is an old blastocyst biopsy picture, uh, and that has certainly become the standard of care. Just one brief slide on why we don't think polar body biopsy is a very good idea. And it's been done in many, many tens of thousands of cases in the United States. It is still the subject of the largest study being done in Europe right now on applying PGD. Um, but we don't think it will lead to at least an ideal end. It's not that the information is not useful. 
It is just that it is potentially misleading, which I think is very, very important. This is an example of a case, and I apologize for the very small graphs, but it's really just there to remind me to tell you that when you get a polar body, there's two of them. And in different circumstances, they should have what's called reciprocal errors. If you find too much in one place, you find too little in the other, and that should, in fact, be very reassuring. But of the different ways that, that this shuffling of genetic material occurs, as the body goes through the natural process of an egg, going from a full set of DNA, 46XX, that's why young ladies are young ladies, to a half set that is now ready to receive the DNA from the sperm and become the new embryo and hopefully the new person, you can actually have two different abnormal polar bodies, two different abnormal extrusions of material and still end up with a normal embryo. The take home message for that is that when you get abnormal results on polar body biopsy, those embryos are classically discarded and that may not be safe. The, the bottom line is, is a very substantial portion of those embryos, perhaps a third, perhaps 40% actually do not represent an abnormality, they represent a normal embryo. And so I no longer believe that polar body biopsy has any contemporary role in reproductive medicine and I believe that is true today. That leaves us two other options. We can go through the classic paradigm. In the roughly 100,000 cycles of PGD done in Europe, about 88% of the biopsies have been done at the cleavage stage on day three. Less than 0.2% have been done at the blastocyst stage over time. So how do you know if it's safe? We have asked this question for years. It's a very difficult question to study because if you take cells out of an embryo and they don't make a baby, maybe that embryo was never destined to make a baby. Only a small percentage of embryos actually result in live-born, healthy children. Uh, looking at different cycles, looking at different things has been very problematic, but recent advances in genetics have provided us with some very powerful tools. Let me, let me tell you about one study you might find interesting. In this study, we took uh, patients who were willing to participate in our research protocol, and we provided completely routine care whatever they needed, just routine clinical care to do our very best to help them conceive. And we got to the end of the in vitro process or the end of the outside of the body process and we picked two embryos that were gonna go back for their transfer. We randomly selected one for biopsy, these are day three embryos, and we took a cell out. And the other one we did not and we put them back at the same time. So then the two embryos go back in the uterus so there, at the time of the transfer, there's one that's been through biopsy and one that has not. So now it's the same cycle and the same hormones and the same lining of the uterus and the same doctor transfer and the same every laboratory conditions. And yet one embryo has had the treatment, biopsy, and one is not, no biopsy, with no use of information now. It's just the biopsy that was done, no results. And then we go back and do DNA fingerprinting and we see what happens to see if implantation occurs. Now if you get Twins, they had the same outcome. That's good. That, would be the, that means they're okay. And unfortunately, if that young lady fails to conceive, it's the same outcome for both embryos. But what if you get a singleton? What if you get one baby? If biopsy is safe, you should get about the one that's implanted to, excuse me, to biopsy to implant just about as often as the other. It should be roughly evenly divided. And when you do that with day three embryos, the answer is it's not evenly divided. And in fact, the implantation rates in the embryo, every patient being compared to themselves, the implantation rate from the non-biopsied embryo was 50. 50% 50 of those embryos turned into babies. But for the biopsied embryos, it was only 30%. And while that is not terrible, the reality is you're losing almost 40% of the babies. Now, I have to tell you, clinically, I don't think we should be doing things that lowers the reproductive potential of the embryos we care for by 40%. It's, a, it's not a safe number, and we, we don't believe that that's an acceptable choice. It's a huge difference. On the other hand, when we did it at the blastocyst stage, there was no difference. And this is the reason that if we're going to get genetic